Take it away, Tom. Oh boy. All right. Failing productively, fail in loathing in East Lansing. Greetings, people of the internet. <laughs> it occurs to me that perhaps the people of the internet might have jobs and other things going on, and so they might appreciate the too long didn't read version of this talk. So I'm going to open with that. The too long didn't read comes to you courtesy of Sir Davos and the happy people of the sunny isles of Westeros. Can we get one of those lights turned on? Oh, but before I do that, if I have sound on this thing, can any, can any of you hear it? You have to turn it on. Okay. So I'm going to vamp for a little moment while we wait to get the, the sound on. Dance, Sean. Dance. Dance, dance. So this is called a productive fail right now. This is, uh, this is called improvisation being the soul of comedy. Uh, are we good? It should work. All right. So just to situate you, we're in season six. And the Lord Commander is having issues. <laughs> Don't worry, there will be no spoilers. Okay. Unless I spoil it. Why? No. No. Okay, let's crank that volume. Do I need to press a button or something? I'm just plugged in with somebody else. It is a truth universally acknowledged that any live digital thing is going to fail <laughs> when you come to do it. Here, we'll try again. Okay, so here's what happens. So <laughs> we have Sir Davos, kindly Sir Davos, giving advice to, to, to Jon Snow. Jon Snow is having issues because you haven't seen season six? <laughs> Okay, well, he's, <laughs> he's upset, he's upset, and he feels like he's failed. And Ser Davos says, good, fail again. Okay, that was the too long didn't read. But basically what I was getting at, that's what this little bit of, um, this is what we call the hook in a lecture where it's supposed to be. The thing is, is Jon Snow failing productively? Because if you had seen season six, I would then tell you what happens next, and we would discuss it. And you would see that, but you'll have to watch the show. <laughs> At any rate, um, for those of you who have seen the show, just ask yourself, does Jon Snow know how to fail productively? He knows nothing. He knows nothing. Valar <laughs> Okay, so we will leave this this where we found it. So I want to talk about failing productively because there is unproductive failure. There are ways of failing that do not do us much good. And I live in a history department right now, so I thought I'd better give you the, the, the backstory on fail. So the structure of this talk, which circles and goes in loops, and so the background image fits the content of which I'm speaking. Um, we'll do a potted history of fail, and we'll talk about the dangers of failing in academ academia. academia. Failing while being a white guy on the internet is a different kettle of fish than failing in being anybody else. So that also has to be taken with, uh, everything I say has to be taken with a grain of salt or a salt lick. Uh, your mileage may vary. We'll, I'll tell you the parable of heritage crowd I will tour you through some of my history of fails, some fails in the wild, and give you a taxonomy of fail so that you understand just what kind of fail you're dealing with and how to make it productive. And then we're going to look at some of the things that you all have been writing this past year, which ties into imposter syndrome and how we deal with that and how we emerge triumphantly with a productive fail. So that's the, that's the plan, that's where we're going. So a potted history of fail, thank you British Library for scanning and putting stuff up. See, this is a visual pun. This is where you can laugh, no? Okay. <laughs> so if you're keeping track at home, that's three fails so far this time. <laughs> so the prehistory, the idea of fail, I wanted to find, well, how long is this idea? You know, this idea that there is such a thing as a productive fail, how far back can it go? Well, it goes back at least as far as Propertius, who tells us that doesn't matter 
it's the attempt itself, that's what wins praise. It's sometimes enough to have tried, which I translate freely as, okay, productive fail, yeah. Um, that's why I didn't go very far in Latin class. And then there's Alkman, Al who's writing in the seventh century, who says trying is the first step of learning. Well, for trying, read, failing. Failing, trying, build it up again, right? This idea that there is valor and worth in giving it your best and, and winning the, the, the prize. I played minor hockey when I was a kid in Shawville, and there was only 12 of us in my year, right? And you need five people on the ice, six people on the ice each side to, to play. And every friggin' year I got most improved. Most improved. <laughs> most improved. It was the same group of guys from when I was five years old to when I was 15. How can you be the most improved every freaking year? Right? It's because you've got to give somebody the ribbon for trying and carrying out, right? So I have a long personal history with fail, and this is why I don't play in the NHL, and there must be somebody I can sue. But as long as we've been human, right, there's always been this idea. Just walk it off. You fell down. That's ah, okay. But, you know, that kind of wears thin after a while. There's got to be more to it than that. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Like, it's... Sorry. I, no? Okay. All right. So, Silicon Valley, yeah? Fail as a Silicon, Silicon Valley ideology. Fail fast, fail often. Yeah! Programmer. Macho. Right? And so I thought, well, let's try and find where this idea comes from. Right? See, see where this idea that um, operationalizing failure is a valuable thing, that it's a viable business strategy somehow. Right? Um, and many tech folks, many startup folks, take, they kind of take it at its word. You know, fail fast, fail often. Yeah, let's burn through this VC funding. Yeah! We lost a million dollars last month. Yeah! Somebody will buy us and it'll be all worthwhile. Like even Wall Street Journal is pushing back now against the whole idea of the fail fast, fail often. And, you know, it, it seems as if they've understood this as lack of success is itself the goal. And that's not what productive fail is about. They kind of screwed it up. So, you know, a good meme does a lot of good things for a <laughs> presentation. Anyways, this one, Samuel Beckett, comes from Westward, West, yeah, Westward Hole. Anyway, something he wrote in 1993, and you see it all over the place. So I started with that idea of failing fast. And in the tech world, there is this idea of the fast fail, uh, this module, this thing that's constantly checking what you're working on and throwing up errors and lets you stop before all hell breaks loose. And I thought, okay, well, maybe that's the idea of where, where failing fast, failing often comes from in, in the tech world. So, of course, the obligatory, obligatory engram um, you know, what Wordles were in about 2010, now engrams are. Yeah, well, fail fast, okay, yeah, it picks up in 98 and woo, goes really fast. Oh, maybe that's where it comes from, that's where it's founded. Um, and then I actually started looking through the, uh, the source data and I find that fail fast enters the digital pedagogy world in at least 2001 in this exact formulation. So that's kind of interesting, maybe that's helping us out here. But it's actually, okay, fail better. That seems to be the, the phrase that kind of ties back more to um, the Samuel Beckett quote. And that, that comes out in 1983. And then it starts jumping up. And you, you only find it up until about here. All of this is coming out of books of literary criticism or you know, stuff in that particular world. And that kind of makes sense. But then it jumps. There's a, uh, it starts, you find it in books on how to play jazz. You find it in um, cooking books. You find it in exercise. It's all over the place. It, like, it, it does that jump into the broader historical consciousness, <coughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, and I, I traced it back 
And it, it turns that there's a book called The Quest for a Unified Theory of Information, uh, which, according to Google Scholar, was cited about 13 times. But the things that cited have themselves been cited over 600 times. So maybe what I'm, you know, in a completely half-assed and last moment way three days ago, I'm tracing something back here that might be more interesting to, to, to push after. And then Dan mentioned yesterday from the, 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 the cathedral in the bazaar, this, this piece about building Netscape and the idea of release early, release often. And I wonder maybe if release early, release often was just too much of a mouthful and becomes transmuted into the fail fast, fail often. But the idea is starting to get really garbled. Right? Pauses while waiting for. Yeah, well, we have to read first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Prize to him. <laughs> okay, so there is a bit of incoherence around the, the concept. Um, and I'm going to complicate things. Oh, I'm such an academic. I'm going to complicate things. I'm just going to introduce one more idea um, Nassim Taleb's <laughs> anti fragile idea, <laughs> right? Because, you know, it's not an academic talk without some kind of asinine phrasing. So, <laughs> and how this connects with the idea of failing better and, and failing fast, maybe what that whole idea was really getting at is what Tassim is calling anti-fragile, right? So fragile things break under stress and randomness, okay? Resilient things just kind of hunker down and stay the same. Um, the anti-fragile thing actually gets stronger as they're exposed to randomness. So, you know, you, you play tennis enough times and you shock and stress that arm, well, it gets stronger, it gets better, and you get lopsided. Um, it's sort of uh, whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stronger, I guess. is the. Does that work? Yeah. Anti-fragile? Maybe? I don't know. Um, the idea that shocks uh, is, are what you need to get better at something. And so we're going to come back to that idea in the, in the context of the imposter syndrome. Um, but I want to talk about uh, things that are anti-fragile or, or the, the zero-sum games of academia, right? The idea that in academia there is no failure. You cannot fail. You cannot try something that doesn't work. You cannot publish something that doesn't have significance at 95%. You can't tell us what didn't work, right? You can't do that because if you do that, you're, um, well, yeah. <laughs> it, it's just not going to work for you. And academic systems are fragile in the sense that they don't tolerate frail. There's no space for it. We teach students, we are very good at teaching students very fast the consequences of trying something a little out there or a little bit different or a little bit pushing the envelope. Your A students are typically those students who fit in the box best. Your C pluses and your B minuses are the ones who are actually thinking. Right? They're the ones who are pushing. They're the ones who are actually trying to do something different. And we punish them. Right? We, we front load it and there, there's no space. So their academic, academic systems are resilient in a sense. They just hunker down under pressure. They don't transform. Um, but they're not anti-fragile. And the idea that fail can break that which is fragile is part of the issue here. Silicon Valley means fail in the sense of anti-fragile, even though they frequently forget that that's what they're talking about. Right, and then burn through everybody's cash and ruin lives and so on. I think that's what they're really, to be charitable, I think that's what they're going for. Um, and academia sees fail as the breaking of something fragile, this perfect uh, glass bloom of, of knowledge production in uh, the modern academy. And that leads <coughs> to a lot of mutual suspicion, right? So especially if you live in this space of digital archaeology or the digital humanities, you know, us neoliberal tools who are ruining the university, it's because of that conflation of these two ideas and misunderstandings of what fail can be. Did any of that make sense? Okay, that's good, because I talk a lot of nonsense. All right. So 
you know, being the sole DH guy in a department or in a, in a cluster of departments means that you, you are viewed with a certain amount of suspicion because you're there to break things, right? And we've got a good thing going here in academia. We don't want people to break stuff. But it's when you break stuff that you find the flaws. It's when you break the pot that you see the fabric and you understand how the damn thing was made. I just made that up. That sounded really good. Okay. So as I was uh, telling Ethan, yeah, I'll talk about fail, I, I thought, I wonder how we actually talk about fail in, in archaeomalology more generally, right? How, as my brother calls it, you're an archaeomalologist. <laughs> um, so a few years ago, um, as you do, I downloaded 20,000 archaeological articles out of JSTOR <laughs> uh, just to see what would happen next. And I... <laughs> I'm not tweeting that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not tweeting that either. Last year, I broke open context by trying to download all of it. Sorry. <laughs> so I, I downloaded 20,000 articles, and I fed it through Andrew Goldstone's uh, Data for Research um, topic browser. So JSTOR will give you 20,000 articles if and only if you download them at 1,000 uh, articles at a time, and, you, and they, they give it to you as a bag of words. So you can't sit there and start reading it. And you've got to do a little bit of statistical magic to, to pull anything interesting out of it. So I've got this thing sitting on my computer. And I thought, OK, well, let's see how people talk about fail in archaeology. So I pretty much grabbed every paper from the English-speaking corpus of journals related to archaeology from about 1936 to 2016, 2014, excuse me. And I fed it through a topic model. So a topic model is about pulling out latent discourse within collections of text. So it, it's, it's magic. And it looks at what's going on. And I couldn't find a topic that seemed to deal with fail. Simply could not find bags of words or discourses or patterns of speech within that 70 odd years of scholarship that was explicitly about fail. Now, maybe if I had searched for 100 topics or 1,000 topics and you know, kept dialing up the resolution, I might have found it. But at 50 or 100, whatever it was I did, I still wasn't finding it. But I was finding two topics that certainly seemed to be about digital archaeology. So topic 45, topic 55. Uh, you can't really read it very well, but this one starts with, with data systems experts, and this one says data, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, there's a link in the presentation. You can explore this for yourself. And I got kind of sidetracked and thought, well, I'll, I'll keep looking at that. This perspective gives you how much this particular topic contributes to the entire corpus over the 70 years. And you can find notable spikes. And this is very much um, data in the sense of what we might have thought of in a kind of Binford processual kind of sensibility. And you can link through to the actual articles. So it, it's, um, and it makes sense with what we've always known about the history of archaeology. But this, this one is kind of neat. Data, system, types, information, type, method. This is kind of cool. This is digital archaeology before digital, the digital age, right? We've got this, an interesting couple of spikes at the beginning, showing that the, the habits of thought that characterize digital archaeology predate the tools with which to do digital archaeology. <coughs> this is entirely an aside and has precious little to do with failure, but it was cool and I thought I would show it to you. It is cool? No? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, cool. It's not a fail. It's not a fail. <laughs> okay. You failed on the I failed. failed. Not so that's a meta fail and my brain goes cool. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm digging through this stuff, trying to find words of fail. And I'll see if I can make this a little bit bigger. So if you go Alt-click on something in this presentation, it will, it will, it ought to, it should have uh, gotten much bigger, but it didn't. Anyways. There we go. No, that's not working either. Yeah, do it. Do it. Yeah. Bollocks. It got bigger yeah. on the screen. It got bigger? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Turns out academics are really, really good at hiding fail. And that's why I wasn't finding it. 
It has long been known, is the phrase, the meaning, I haven't bothered to look up the original <laughs> reference, of great theoretical and practical importance. I found it interesting. <laughs> While it has not been possible to provide definite answers to these questions, the experiment didn't work, but I wanted to publish anyway. <laughs> we are good at hiding fail, right? We, we gloss over and we don't really confront fail. Everything is a win. We are above average, every single one of us, right? That was a joke. Yes. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Okay. So, okay, let's make this back to where it was. There we go. Hypothesis testing and all that crap, right? <laughs> Science and archaeology, we're supposed to report the stuff that didn't work. The scientific method, you're supposed to report the stuff that didn't work. We never report the stuff that didn't work. But if we don't know, then how do you know whether it's vale la pena? How do we know if it's worth the bother? How do we know that we're not doing the same shit that somebody at the university down the street is doing and similarly hitting a... We waste millions of dollars replicating the same crap all the time. Pokemon Go comes out and I'm seeing people proposing things like uh, a proposal to figure out how to build a treasure hunting app to increase cultural heritage knowledge. We've been doing that for the better part of 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, but we still keep reinventing the same goddamn wheel. Because we don't talk about fail. We don't talk about stuff that didn't work. I'm sick and tired of doing the same shit that everybody else does. It's where I'm coming from, said the man who's doing the same shit as everybody else is doing. <laughs> so I'm going to take you through um, some, some personal fails. Okay. And the first personal fail I'm going to take you through is the one that was the most devastating. Okay. This was the Heritage Crowd project. You can only find it now on the Internet Archive in the Wayback Machine. This was my first big debutante project as a formal, official, card-carrying academic back in 2011. And it, uh, it was the bee's knees, it was the, the mutt's nuts, it, it was everything. It was going to be the most uh, amazing project you ever saw. I was going to, crowdsourcing was big in 2011, I was going to crowdsource cultural heritage knowledge from an, I was going to use the internet in an area that didn't have internet connectivity and they were <laughs> going to be able to phone a number and leave a story about their place and it was going to automatically transcribe the, that audio into text and I was going to put it on the map and it was going to, it was going to be awesome. <laughs> It was going to be awesome. And, um, whoops. <laughs> and it, it, it completely went, <laughs> it was not good. <coughs> so, I get really sad about this. You can look this up on my blog, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this a little bit. Um, Okay, let me tell you. I'm going to testify. I am a failed archaeologist. Okay? And I got my PhD in 2002 and enjoyed a long time of reflection on my choices to that point. Um, as I had two academic interviews in the, the, um, the time after that, one in 2004, the other one in 2010. So I'm batting 500. Um, and so I got the job as a digital humanities guy in the history department in a Canadian university, but I studied Roman archaeology, Roman bricks from the first century in the Tiber Valley on the West Bank. There's a lot of difference between there and here, right? Um, so my, my imposter syndrome was all the way up to 11, and I was trying to, um, I, I was trying to, I was trying too hard. I was trying to be all things that first couple of years. I was, um, just before I got to Carleton, I had been blogging for a number of years, trying to keep myself sane, trying to 
pretend like I was still an archaeologist. And I was getting absolutely nowhere, right, until I started giving it away, until I just started talking about shit that wasn't working for me. You know, one of the first people who actually responded to me on the blog was that guy right there. It's your fault. <laughs> um, so, so when I actually, and it, it was the blogging and it was this giving everything away and, and just letting it all hang out, digitally speaking, that actually, yeah, uh, there's a writer on that one, um, that gave me the wherewithal to apply for this job as a digital humanities guy. Yeah. What's digital humanities? I don't know, but uh, I do digital humanities <laughs> stuff. Right, so the imposter syndrome was up in high, high gear. And it utterly, utterly failed. And it failed for a number of different reasons. It uh, failed because I didn't read the security updates on the platform that I was re using. The Ushahidi platform is awesome. It's for crowd mapping crises, clean water, fires, uh, earthquakes, different things like that, and I had uh, repurposed it for cultural heritage. But I didn't bother reading the security updates. Did I back things up? Hell no, I didn't back things up. Backing things up is for, yeah, so <laughs> people who fail. Um, there are a wide variety of things that I did that were <laughs> profoundly stupid. Who knew that you could do an SQL injection attack on a forum, on a website running um, PHP. Well, everybody who read the goddamn security update. <laughs> um, so I didn't, I sat there that morning and I looked at the dead screen where my project had been. And I was like, what the hell do I do now? Nobody in my department knows what I do anyway. Maybe I can just sweep this under the rug. But I kind of said, oh, to hell with it, and I wrote it up, and I put it on the blog and said, okay, this is what has happened, I think. I had just published a glowing, happy article about all the wonderful things that were coming out of the Heritage Crowd Project, even though it is still early days yet. Like that whole list of weasel words, right in there. Um, so, you know, this is the, the PS that was on my, on my blog. And I had just read a piece by Bethany Novisky, who was reflecting on a piece by Tom Scheinfeld about the Lunar Man, right? So in 18th century Birmingham, there was this social club that met once a month, um, the Lunar Society of Birmingham, or the Lunatic Society. And these guys were doing that kind of heroic science that we know in the 19th century, but they were doing it in the 18th century when people didn't have a clue what was going on anyway. Right? So these are the guys who are figuring out things like, how do you do an academic journal? What does a conference look like? What does it mean to be scholarly? How does this whole infrastructure work? They were doing all that nitty gritty, unglamorous kind of donkey work um, that sets the stage for all of that marvelous stuff that happens in 19th century science and technology. right? And it kind of made me feel better, right? Because she writes about, you know, if you agree that there's something remarkable about a generation of trained scholars ready to do this, to become the systems builders for the humanities, you might say, well, I'm a lunatic too. And that made me feel very special, right? And I, I, and I don't mean to sound facetious. That really did make me feel a lot better about this and about sharing it. It was reading this that prompted me to, to share the fail in the first place because Sure as hell, somebody else was going to spend a hell of a lot of money building something and make the same boneheaded mistakes that I made because nobody tells us how to do any of this shit, right? We don't, I mean, that's why you're here because nobody told you, so you're trying to, to find it. So maybe my role is to fail gloriously and often so you don't have to do with that. And that's been my shtick ever since. I've been breaking things in public and failing like nobody's business ever since then. Um, so the parable of heritage crowd is that sometimes shit happens, but it's important to come back and tell us all what happened. That there is no shame in looking at what has gone wrong and thinking about why it has gone wrong 
reflecting on what's going, gone wrong and explaining what to do about that, right? Said the white guy on the internet in 2016. <laughs> But part of what the parable teaches us is that it's about finding your people that understand. There is no point in me talking about any of this stuff with a third of the people I come into daily contact with because they just, this isn't where their head is. This isn't their headspace. You've got to find that group. And if that group is in a private Facebook group, then so be it. If it's on the open web, good for you. If it works on a closed Twitter account with certain other people, that's awesome. But the worst thing, the single worst thing, the single thing that turns a fail into an unproductive fail is that you hide it inside, you bottle it up, and you push it way down deep, and you never speak about it again. That will only cause your imposter syndrome to go through the roof, and there is no productive way of dealing with that. So let's see some other ways I've screwed up in recent years. This is going to be fun. We're going to start as a grad student on the Tiber Valley Project. Hello, Tiber Valley Project people, if any of you are watching, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and you might want to look at the database from uh, April 1998 <laughs> to June 1998. Um, Tiber Valley Pro Database. I was a data entry guy taking old field walking sheets from the 1960s and putting them into an access database. At using a form. The form had been devised to keep morons like me from screwing things up. But there was always this slight little problem. There's this one class of material that never quite fit right. And as is my want, I started clicking randomly around and found, hey, I can change the form. I can add stuff to it. Awesome. So I fixed things. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, I found myself moving crates from the baraka in the back <laughs> to the basement and did that for several months while they tried to repair the damage that I did. Um, and I shoved that fail way down deep and I've never spoken of it again until now. Um, that was an unproductive failure. Well, it was productive in the sense that I've never touched access again since. <laughs> so, so don't ask me for, for access stuff. I, I published this one as my glorious failure. Um, this was uh, from my, my sojourn in the wilderness of uh, online education at various for-profit and not-for-profit places uh, from Play the Past, where I, I got tired of the regular essay prompt that I wasn't allowed to, to change up. So I built a scenario in Civ 4, which I got for Christmas that year from my wife. And I gave that to students to, to play and ask them to keep a diary of how my scenario of the year of the four emperors played out differently from the history that they knew to be true. And I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted them to, well, it doesn't really matter because it didn't work because nobody played the damn thing. They, <laughs> they all looked at it and said, this looks really fascinating. And I did play it and it's really cool, but if it's all right by you, I'll just write the essay anyway. right? So uh, my glorious failure, it didn't work worth a damn, but I learned something about teaching right there. I learned that when you're, when you're doing something that just feels so different from what everybody has been conditioned to accept that is proper and the, the correct way of doing academia, of being a student, woe betide the man who asks people to do something different. You gotta do a lot of legwork beforehand to make it feel safe. And I was asking them to fail. I was asking them to play a game and lose and to reflect on that. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna wanna play with me anymore. <laughs> so, having not learned that lesson, I tried again <clears throat> in a class where I wanted people to understand how Wikipedia generates knowledge, how it works, how people learn things, how how articles are written, and I had a first year seminar. First year seminar, kids fresh out of high school, they haven't been indoctrinated yet in, in uh, multiple choice, midterm, <laughs> final essay, final exam, barf it all out, regurgitate, repeat, right? They hadn't, I thought I could work with them. And my declared history majors in the class were all sick that day 
that we tried editing a Wikipedia page because it just felt too different. Proper historians do not write on Wikipedia, right? First year students, they'd already internalized all that. It's hard to use fail as a pedagogy when people have already got a strong sense of what's right and what's wrong and what counts and what doesn't count. So not having learned from that, I tried again. And again, and this time it was an interactive fiction meant to um, decenter people's top-down vision of space, right? We do all these maps, we do our point maps, we've got north at the top, and that has implications for how we understand ancient space. So I tried to build a simulation that let people experience space without the benefit of a map. Um, and people w were unhappy. How do I play interactive fiction for an A? Like, how? <laughs> was a real question, right? I'm like, well, you just play it, and then we talk about it. And, right, again, fail as a pedagogy, right, works when you've got the framework. And each time I've tried, it has always astonished me at how much framework I didn't build, right? I think, okay, this time I've cracked it, and this time it's going to work. Yeah, you should see my teaching scores. Holy shit. <laughs> um, so not having learned from that fail, I tried again. And this time was with a grad class. Master students. The best undergrads, they join your MA program. Yeah, we'll push the boundaries. We'll think about stuff. We'll do interesting things. No, no, no. <laughs> MA students are so well invested in the system that exists that if you say, OK, we're going to use augmented reality to try and tell environmental history, and the whole class is about the question of how do we do that? Oh, no, 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 no. That that doesn't go well. You're messing with my life here, sir. You're messing with my potential job. I'm not, no, 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 no. The teaching evals on this were like, people were angry. But if you watch the video, they're talking, they're, they've clearly learned something about spatial storytelling and how history has real impact in real spaces and how to engage with public. These are public history students for crying out loud. But again, the framework that goes around. Do you, do you sense a theme here? Is this, is this making sense? So those were some of my own personal fails. That's sort of a whistle-stop tour through some of the funnest ones. Funnest is a word? Sure. OK. Um, so on Twitter a couple weeks ago, I said, so archaeological case studies of fail. Anyone? And uh, Adela sort of, so, so, Forgive me, I, I'm going to mispronounce this, but um, from the fames, uh, Adela, she uh, sent me very graciously um, an article that she's writing up for that, that digital archaeology volume coming out of the same one that Eric is in, uh, about field studies or case studies of people using their, um, their paperless recording system for archaeology. The system works really, really well. This, this isn't so much where the fail comes into it. The fail comes into it when a um, couple of different groups, they've learned that no matter how much um, framework you put around trying to use a, a new system and getting into it, and how much testing you end up doing in the safe confines of your, your lab or your office or your, your local neighborhood, it's all going to go pear-shaped when you actually get out into the field because there's always something that you couldn't plan for like um, it's and and there's very much like what uh, Ben was saying uh, about the Kobo toolbox and, and everything that he was discussing on the first day almost word for word the kinds of things that are being discussed in this so when this paper comes out go read it it's, it's very very good um, that's a productive fail that's a fail where things that they've learned in the field come back to change the architecture and the working of how their entire system works so it's forms on your device in a server and whether that server is in Australia or whether you've got a server in the field and how you do it. So a very, that kind of stuff you need to know. If it doesn't work, that's not the sort of thing um, to hide. Michael Carter at Ryerson, he's a PhD student, um, 
sorry, Michael, I can't remember whether you still are or whether you've completed. I, I'm assuming you're, you're out there. Um, but he is looking at Iroquoian longhouses in Ontario, right? And we have this reconstruction that was published in the decades and decades ago, which has informed all subsequent reconstructions. So he comes from the world of animation originally, and he's using procedural animation to start with the archaeological material and to figure out what the rules of thumb are that generate an Iroquoian longhouse. And each time he builds something, it is by definition a fail because he doesn't know what he's looking for, but how he works with that is that the fail then informs the subsequent iteration, right? A productive fail, using what you've learned to, to make changes into how you're, you're going forward. And I wasn't sure about whether in, in, including this or not, but Dan suggested I do, so I did. And thank you to uh, Zena and Gabe for, for sharing material. So this is a, was a one-third reconstruction of the arch, triumphal arch at Palmyra that was destroyed by ISIS. And this outfit called the Institute for Digital Archaeology, very well-funded, polished-looking outfit to judge from their website, um, took the laser scans that did exist of that arch, uh, fed them through a cutting machine stone blocks. This isn't a 3D print, it's a cut stone blocks that have been resurrected, and put it in Trafalgar Square. And the idea was to, to show how we can rebuild Palmyra and to show the people of Palmyra that we're still standing with them. Is this a fail of digital archaeology? Is this a fail of archaeological ethics? Um, I mean, planting this in the epicenter of the monuments to British imperialism <laughs> kind of sends a bit of a message, right? About, you know, one way of reading this is a signal that those <coughs> folks who are the other, you can't handle your heritage, so we're going to take care of it for you here. Uh, Gabe didn't mu uh, muck about. One third scale model surrounded by men in suits congratulating one another. Masterclass in heritage fuckery. <laughs> um, and uh, in Zena's project, she's, she was passing out these cards to get people's impressions, to see what they were thinking. And it used uh, micropasts to, to, to transcribe them all. And this is a very typical card. It's a great idea to reconstruct. It's good. It's sad that we have to, but it's amazing. So fail also depends on your perspective and your background and where you're coming from. Lots of people viewed this as a triumph, right? Uh, lots of people didn't. If it's a digital fail, I think it's a digital fail in the sense that it cements in people's minds that digital archaeology is all about gee whiz wizardry divorced from any of the humanistic aspects of what archaeology is about about um, that it's all about the tech, that it's fetishism, that it's the neoliberalism. You know, like it's, do, do you see where I'm going here? Does this make any sense at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. So is it a fail or is it not a fail? I'm not sure. Um, only from the limited perspective of what fail in digital archaeology. Is it a fail for what it does for digital archaeology? Like, I'm talking about digital archaeology as this way of looking at the world and, and, and way of being an academic and way of doing things. And this is saying, woo, I've got a fast computer. Right? It's, it's programmer culture and institutional stone. I should shut up now before I say something. Because I, I, I don't know whether I'm making sense anymore. Yes, you are. Oh, thank you. You complete me. <laughs> we've been there too. Okay, good. good. We've all been there, right? <clears throat> we've all been there. We've all failed. And I think when you're confronted with a fail, you've got that horrible feeling that comes up in that little moment of panic, and it's hard to see the value. So um, Brian Croxell and Qu uh, Quinn Warnick wrote a piece uh, in the MLA Digital Pedagogy volume that's coming out on digital pedagogy. And they were talking about a taxonomy of fail in digital pedagogy where, for when you're teaching digital stuff. And I looked at that and thought, actually, this taxonomy works for us too. 
So it's got four levels, right? And there's a, there should be a line between two and three because fails one and two and fails three and four are slightly different beasts. One is that technological failure when the damn thing just doesn't work, right? You're trying to install Omika and it just doesn't work because it runs on Apache and you've got Windows 3.1, right? It, it's just not working because of technical issues. Then there's human failure. Um, it doesn't work because you just don't know what you're doing. Um, <coughs> wow, I'm way ahead of my notes here. Fail. Um, you know, it's, so the first, the first is about what happened. The second is about the reaction to what happened, maybe. Uh, no, that's not right. Erase that thought. These two refer to what happened. These two refer to our, ref our reaction to it. So failure as an artifact is a, that response saying, okay, what is it about the way Windows 3.1 is designed that it promotes these kinds of failures? What is it? You know, we're archaeologists. I play one at work. Will you? Okay. Um, we're used to thinking about the materiality, the affordances of these things. Well, digital stuff has materiality and affordances too. Archaeologists are very well positioned to do <coughs> digital stuff, digital humanities, whatever, because we're already thinking about thinginess and what that does and what that means to be human, right? And that's the thing that this Institute of Digital Archaeology seems to have forgotten. So there's failure as an artifact, and then there's failure as epistemology, right? Where the failure is deliberately sought out for what it can teach us. And maybe, maybe there should be a fifth fail, um, failing to reflect, failing to come back and tell the rest of us what happened, failure to communicate. What we've got here is a failure to communicate. So, no, okay. Moving swiftly onwards. Whoops. So I'm going to classify my various fails. Okay. So the Tiber Valley Project database, that was a human fail. That form was deliberately made the way it was, but I thought I knew stuff. So that's my fault. Using CIP4 in my classroom, again, a human fail. I didn't prep my students. Heritage Crowd, that was a tech fail and a human fail. Um, my interactive fiction, Stranger in These Parts, again, human fail. The technology worked the way it was. I just, my students just had never encountered interactive fiction before. And it was just amongst other problems. My uh, augmented reality with my history class, that was a, a tech fail and a human fail because they had they just, they were trying to do way too much with the wrong tools and so on. Um, sometimes with the f uh, fames, there's a bit of a tech failure, but then we all look at it and understand why it's doing what it's doing. And probably there should also be a four because those fails have also fed back into the teaching. Um, and the epistemology that definitely Michael Carter's long has is, is built around this epistemological failure because that's what teaches them. That's what moves his research literally forward. And I'm going to classify the Palmyre Palmyrene Arch as a, as a human fail because they forgot about humans, basically. I find it helpful to, cla to, to do this sort of thing because while I was doing that, it helped me cement what is it that I actually think and believe about digital archaeology, right? Digital archaeology is not about fancy, zippy, whippy tools. Fancy, zippy, whippy tools enable us to do digital archaeology, but as the topic model of that 20,000 article shows, you can have that digital archaeology mindset and do nothing but pay, pen and paper, said the man who doesn't own a smartphone. <laughs> okay? So, it's digital archaeology, it's you know, your mileage may vary, but it's about the productive pedagogical fail. And that pedagogical aspect of the productive fail makes it a public archaeology. And because we're failing in public, that is the thing that digital archaeology can teach all the other flavors of archaeology. 
in my mind, this is when I thought you would storm the barricades and jump up and yell hallelujah or amen or something. Like that. No, I'm, I'm not getting it. Okay. Thank you, Mary. You complete me. Um, but this is what I think. This is what, like, my, my, you know, you have to do the teaching philosophy for work. You, you, know, you have to put that on the syllabus. Well, this is basically what it comes down to. My students come into my classes. I tell them, I am setting you up to fail at different things. What is interesting is how you react to that. As you can imagine, I have great attrition in a lot of my classes. <laughs> but for the students who buy into it, it's friggin' amazing the stuff that they do and what they come up with. Deep breath, we're almost done. If you don't wish to carry on, please speak to Ethan. <laughs> So I'm going to stop talking for a little bit because I want you folk to all talk for a moment. Know yourself. Over the last year, you have had fails. What are the nature of your fails? Just take a moment and think about what kind of fails have you had recently? For those of you following along at home, you can tweet your fails if you wish. <laughs> You're going to tell people what your fails are in a moment. You don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell the world. But take a moment. I'm sure there's probably one just it has been sitting on your shoulder this whole time, and you've been thinking, I need to talk to somebody at MSU Die, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't, I don't want to admit that this happened, but I should. Or maybe it was so much that you got to the point where you're thinking, I, I just got to withdraw. I just got to get out. I can't, I can't do this. I can't face this. That secret horrible fail. Share it with the person beside you now. <clears throat> now, seriously, start talking. You don't have to tell me yet, but I just want you to... to I want your archaeological fails. I want your digital archaeology fails. Maybe I just should go, because I'm so... How are we doing for time? While you're talking about your digital fails, I want you to think too, what kind of fail has it been? They're failing. <laughs> Okay, so folks, you've lost the map. My kids are in kindergarten. If I do this, they go silent. It's like <laughs> classical conditioning. So I'm not going to ask you to share now in public what those fails are. I'm just going to ask for a vocal indication of, do we have any type 1 fails? Yeah. 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 OK, we got, do we have any type 2 fails? Yeah. yeah. OK, do we have any type 3 fails? Not yet. Okay, Not yet. so that one is where you're, you're actually analyzing the, the tool you're trying to use and going, why the f is this damn thing not working? And you realize this is the wrong tool. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. okay. Yes. Failure is epistemology. Do we have any of those? Yes. We've got a couple. Failing to reflect? Has anybody? Yeah. Okay. So. You know, it's, does it feel kind of good telling somebody else that shit happened and you didn't know what to do? Yeah. I'm healed. Eh? I'm healed. You're healed! <laughs> I can walk! Right? 
keeping that fail bottle, I feel like a self-help guru, uh, <laughs> but it, it is really important to, to move this beyond the shiny tools are awesome, and look what I can do, Ma. You have to really be talking about the stuff that didn't work and thinking through why it hasn't worked. And that's what gets it to be a productive fail. If you can classify it on this taxonomy, you're nine-tenths of the way to having a productive fail because the taxonomy forces you to think through, okay, if it's this kind of fail, then where does the solution work? <coughs> How can I make lemons from lemonade? Can we fork your taxonomy? Absolutely. <laughs> Indeed, if you go to the, the URL for this presentation, swap out the .html and put in .md, you'll get the source markdown document, which includes my half-assed notes uh, as well. So fork away, fork away, fork away all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you all talked about fail. Now I'm going to see if you actually talked about fail in public, if you were actually productive in your fail, if MSU die has actually been meaning what it's supposed to do. So I topic modeled all of your blog posts, and I did word vectors. There are 114 posts on average, 400 odd words in 2015, uh, 516, 2016. And uh, if you go to this link, you can take a copy of my analysis and data and run the numbers for yourself. So I was looking for fail. And so the first thing I did, there's a technique called word vectors, which <laughs> literally imagines the space between words as a kind of geographic space. And you can define a vector of all the words that go with some other word, and that gives you a sense. Um, if topic models give you a top-down view of how discourse is happening in a collection of material, word vectors give you a bottom-up from the perspective of individual words or, or spectrums of words. Does that make any sense at all? Okay, it's all magic. And so I wanted to see, well, how are you talking? I figured if you were talking about fail, you would say, I X, Y, Z. I did this. I tried something. It didn't work. So these were the words. Shift. Frustrating. Help. Seemed. Nunalit. Uh, <laughs> tutorials. I've experimented. Existing. Unfortunately. So, <laughs> you know, there's, there, there's, there's ideas of fail hiding in there. And I thought, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll cluster this up. So we've got a group over here. My working beginning. Let all documents me. I quite... There's a, there seems to be, uh, when you start looking at it very closely, there's sort of a, forgive me, Ethan, for I have sinned. It has been two <laughs> months since my last blog post. <laughs> there's a lot of guilt about not posting, it seems. And I thought, okay, well, that takes me somewhere. So I'm going to, one of the interesting things you can do with word vectors is define a spectrum. So if you're interested in gender, for instance, in a corpus, you could define a spectrum where he is on one side and she is on the other, and you would look at the space of words and how they, how they, they, they go along that spectrum. And then if you were looking at um, you know, teaching evaluation, so this all comes from Ben Schmidt, I've reused his, his code, and he was looking at uh, rate my prof comments. So he defined a spectrum between he and she and good and bad, and then you cross that and you end up with a space of gendered language discussing male and female profs. So I took that same code, swapped out his information, put in my own. So I defined a vector uh, that I called the fail vector. It sounds like a you know, Robert Ludlum novel. And so I have words like easy, does, can, able, easily. So happy words about ability with their exact antonyms, cannot, unable, uh, etc. on the other. And I crossed it with a vector <coughs> between I and me and it. I figured if you were talking about it, it would be software, the machine, or, you know, it's, it's fuzzy, it's not perfect, but this is what you end up with. So on this side, this column, these are words that go on that me, I, me vector, and on this side, it's the it vector. Never mind the labels, I kind of screwed that up. And the top here are words that are the negative, the unable words and the blue are the able words. So, deadline, presentation, bin, month, you know, this is the forgive me, I have not posted stuff. People are worried about presentation in the summer. 
there's a real sense that shit is happening. Um, navigation, framework, design, free. We like free software. Uh, templates, we like templates. We decided whenever you finally make a decision, you are positive about it. Shit or get off the pot, you'll feel better. <laughs> My mom used to say. Okay, um, words that representation eagles i don't know why uh, <laughs> remains interactions groups everybody hates group work um, the saa uh, so what i'm getting at again though you're not really you're always putting a really positive gloss on everything you're not really confronting fail yeah because it's out there because it's public and and again, I'm a white dude on the internet. You know, you might not want to actually take everything I say as something that you ought to do. You got to, you got to think about your own situation. You got to think about what's safe and reasonable, right? You got to push where it's, where the risk and the reward, where it's good to push. You know, I'm not recommending anybody go out and do something that's going to get you fired. Because we all talk about fail like it's a good thing. But I can think of people in my institution who would lose their sense of well-being if I talked about this kind of thing in um, say a, a, a grad meeting where we were rejigging the program for instance not that I did that <laughs> anyways so that that's the caveat that you always have to be thinking about uh, back to the fun stuff I did a topic model. This comes from Ben Marwick's code on the day of archaeology from 2012 I just fed your stuff into it so some more topics and change over time. So there are some topics nobody talked about in 2015, but then we talked about a lot in 2016. Uh, so this 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. 24 is process, creative, public, blog style. Forgive me, Ethan, for I have not posted. <laughs> right? So it's fun to look at that. And I'll leave you to look at that repository on your own to, to see some of these topics do seem to deal with fail and process, some don't. And it's worth thinking about your own process and whether or not fail as epistemology or fail as reflection or fail as artifact, if that is moving your process forward. You know, we all bitch about things not working and that's totally cool. But you gotta move beyond that, right? You gotta use that as the prompt to, to change how you're working. So yeah, it's a Jupyter notebook, which is kind of fun, because you can put your data and your code and your write-up about it all mixed together. A lot of our projects are more on the public side of thing, about communicating to stakeholder communities, about getting material out there. But at some point, you might want to start um, you know, doing some of that more statistical side of things in digital archaeology. And, or the the use of digital tools for qualitative analysis of material rather than strictly quantitative. Look up Jupyter Notebooks as a way of merging your, your, your code and your write-up and that sort of thing. And I can talk with anybody who's interested about that later. A f I'm sorry, is this where I want to be? Yep. A fail shared is not a failure. Okay? If nothing else I say sticks with you, a fail shared is not a failure because even though I screwed up Heritage Crowd, somebody else using Ushahidi or using other projects won't fail. When you move, everybody moves forward, right? Uh, da, 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 da. Do I want to talk about this? I'll let you look at this um, later because if a fail shared is not a failure, then there also comes the point where actually things work the way you want it to work. And yeah, that isn't quite what I meant to say, but whatever. Uh, there are ways for us to get our material out there, our fails out there, so other people can use it. And Ben is talking more from a statistical perspective here, but um, use stuff that minimizes pointing and clicking. If something goes wrong with a point and click type thing, if they update the software, then whatever it was you learned isn't applicable anymore. This is the problem I have, you know, like 
you ever get a family member calling you up and asking you how to do something on the computer and you're trying to tell them how to click, click, click and their system doesn't look quite like your system? Yeah. So minimize pointing and clicking. You know, we talked last year about version control, but I'm going to hammer that again. And he's saying, you know, you, you keep your notes about what's going on. And these are frequently in very different documents. And if you're anything like me in very different parts of your computer and you can never find the damn things again, right? Or you've got final document for, I really mean it this time, doc, <laughs> right? <laughs> Keep those things together. Keep them in the same document. So this is where things like Markdown or, or other um, mark, minimal markup languages are, are helpful. But this is stuff to aim towards because none of us are really at that level yet, right? Ben Marwick is awesome. He is uh, doing such cool things. He publishes the paper, yeah, but he also has the digital appendix with all of the code, all of the data, all of the write-up, all of the dependencies, all of everything you need to reproduce the things that weren't. So if you look at his paper and say, you're full of shit, then it's on you to go and actually take a look at it for yourself. And he's using GitHub for this, but he also has DOIs, right? If you, there are services out there to, to mint digital object identifiers, at, like Zenodo and Figshare and different things. And if you've got an experiment and you know what, it didn't really work and you're not going to go any further down this road, put it together nicely, put it up in GitHub, get a DOI for it, and then it becomes citable. Then it lets you play the games of academia or whatever the metric is in your particular institution. And it turns what had been just Sean faffing around with Markov chains into something that somebody else can take a look at, can cite, you know, because you see what I'm saying here? It makes it safe for other people to, to work with your fail. And that's really, really quite critical. So, you know, put your experiment, your project in its own folder. You know, you know do as I say, not as I do. Have sensible subfolders. Uh, keep it under version control. Get your DOI. Write up what you were thinking at every stage. Put it on a blog, put it in a text file somewhere. Put that up as well, get the DOI for it. And you know, by stealth, by making it safe, by making it look like other things that the, the non-digital archeologists are familiar with, we take over. You know, we are the invading parasite. That's a horrible, no, you know, I'm sorry I went that way, but I was reading a thing about zombie honeybees this morning. Anyway, sorry, forget it. Forget I said that. So, you know, Dan Foreman Mackey, um, this is his blog, and he, he's pushing his blog posts through Zenodo, and he ends up with a DOI. So now you can, you can fit that into whatever. We, we get hung up in academia on the forms and the formalisms of academia and forget about the content. Well, this will satisfy the most nitpicky citation Nazi out there, right? You can do this. Am I making sense? Okay. It's counted in all those numbers and it's indexes. counted. Yeah, right. They want metrics. By God, we'll give them metrics, <laughs> right? So, you know, I'm keeping an open notebook during my sabbatical year this year. And what's also kind of fun about this? So I, I write everything in text files, and then I push it to this site, and it it ends up here. Um, I've also installed Hypothesis, the Hypothesis web annotation toolbar on the site. So if there's something interesting on my site that works for you, you can leave an annotation on the site. You can highlight the text, you can link to it, you can keep that annotation entirely private, but it's still yours. And those annotations can be public, can be private, can be grouped, but they can be cited in and of themselves because they all have unique resource identifiers. And there's an API for Hypothesis to pull all of your annotations from all over the web into your own notebook of readings and research. So imagine if we all had open research notebooks and we were all annotating each other's stuff. Imagine the web of stuff we would know, right? You talk about silos, forget, you know, sometimes you can do it yourself. Sometimes you can build this stuff up for yourself. So um, if you ever find yourself you know, unable to sleep some night, please do read my notebook and 
annotate the snot out of it. And you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody at Carleton one afternoon and I was saying, oh, you should do this, you should do that. And I was getting all really excited. And she said to me, but Sean, you were hired to be the digital humanities guy. They expect you to do this kind of stuff, right? So I'm ambivalent in a sense about, you know, it, we're really taught not to talk about fails and things that don't work, to relentlessly put forward that public face. So I feel, I always feel ambivalent about doing that, even though I, I really do believe that this is something that we should be doing. But I'm also ambivalent about it too, because I know I'm kind of in a privileged spot. And, and I get, I, that kind of thing bums me out. So, take this presentation to bits. Find the useful stuff in it. Ignore the dangerous stuff. And just grab the little bit that makes a difference for you now. And that'll have been a successful, um, <laughs> <laughs> That'll have been a successful fail, right? I'm an imposter. I'm an imposter every day. I'm a Roman archaeologist of stamped bricks of the first to third centuries in the Tiber Valley uh, on the West Bank, hiding as the DH guy in a history department at a Canadian university who hasn't been to Rome in well over a decade now. I'm an imposter. I'm faking it every single day. But, you know, we're all imposters. That imposter syndrome, we never talk about the inverse of that. There's an inverse syndrome whose name I forget, but basically it comes down to this. Idiots think they know a hell of a lot more than they actually do. I would far <coughs> rather feel like an imposter. You know why you feel like an imposter? It's because you've had fails and you've reflected on them and you've learned from them, right? The more you feel like an imposter, the more you are actually in that zone where good learning happens, okay? You all know the colleague who can't be taught, who can't learn, who can't get their head around a new idea. Those, those folks, those guys, typically, are extremely confident. They never feel like imposters. To hell with that. I would rather feel like an imposter. I, my name is Sean Graham. I am an imposter. And my final thought, the final thing that I'm going to leave to you, Y'all read Terry Pratchett? If you haven't, read the Tiffany Aching Cycle. Tiffany Aching is a little girl who discovers that she's a witch. She suffers from, I think, Tiffany Aching. So Terry Pratchett is the novelist, and the cycle of stories revolves around a character named Tiffany Aching, who discovers she's a witch. She has imposter syndrome. She doesn't feel like a witch. And what's more, she has first thoughts, what she's thinking, second thoughts, thoughts about what she's thinking, and third thoughts, thoughts about how she's thinking about her thoughts, right? That's how I want you to be thinking about fail. Be like Tiffany Aiken. Sit back, think about what kind of fail you're dealing with, identify it, it's type one or two, usually. Think about how you're reacting to that fail, that's a three or four. Reflect on that reflection, and you will never have a type five failure. You will have failed productively. <laughs> For more on this and other fails, see electricarchaeology.ca. <laughs> <laughs>
embedded in the rib cage of an extinct bison. So, you know, that really tells us a lot about our own discipline, and it also, you know, how do we how do we get to those students? How do we get those advanced undergraduates, and how do we get those graduate students to just sort of shake them up and and, and not worry about what do I need to do to earn an A? Yeah. Well, we've done we've we've built a system where grades reward students who are very good at playing the game of being a student. So if I'm playing the game of being an academic, I give them what they're looking for, which are very safe and, uh, you know, like the kinds of assessment that they are expecting to encounter. And so the students who are very good at that are students who have learned how to be very good at those kinds of assessment. So. And when you, when you shake that up, when you, you know, I tell my students, you're not writing essays for me. Um, that really gets people uncomfortable, and that, from that uncomfortableness can come a lot of anger in, and that comes out in different ways. But I've found that the students who, um, who do best in my classes are not necessarily... Um, the best at playing the game of being a student in other parts of the university. And so it, it just goes to show you, you know, sometimes I think to myself, especially with my graduate students, I, if it were up to me, I would simply have pass fail in the course, and that would be that. Um, but yeah, so if our system is set up to reward those people who are best at being at the game, who are best at the game of being a student, but if we look at those other students who aren't, right? You see that they actually are, are coming at things sideways. And, and coming at things sideways is something that I think I'm coming to value more and more in what I see. And if it comes in my history class, it's great. But if it comes somewhere else, it's <coughs> better. So you mentioned a lot of, um, kind of pedagogical fails. Um, and I think that that's something that I really because <laughs> <laughs> like, I see the stuff that you do with your students and it seems like this would be the most fantastic thing ever. You actually get to do the stuff yeah. that you're supposedly learning about in class rather than just sitting and being, being told stuff. Yeah. Um, so have you, have you found the balance to like give them enough of that support to fail or the structure for the assignments that they seem to kind of accept the difference from the, from the normal? I teach a class on video games in history uh, where the final assessment piece is on the, the building of, of a video game. You are going to make a video game in this class. You know, completely upfront. It's in the syllabus, it's in all the advertising. And I still had a group of students say, yeah, you know what, we never really bought into this. Could we write an essay? And I'm, I'm thinking, if I, I'm teaching a freaking class on video games where you make a video game where I've told you that a video game is going to be made and you still want a goddamn essay? Uh, so, <laughs> I like to think I'm getting better at, at giving the framework that allows more and more students to actually say, okay, I don't, I, I can buy into this. And I think it's, um, I haven't yet found the right balance between doing all the weird stuff that I really love and doing the stuff from the game of being a student that makes students feel secure, right? And there has to be that balance. Uh, if you go too far into the weird stuff, then especially if you're on, you know, you're on the tenure track or you're a, an adjunct, the consequences of that can be problematic, right? So what has worked is the longer I've been at Carleton, the more I can move to the weird end of the spectrum. Because students might know who I am, but what's more, my colleagues know the kinds of things that I do and can also help prep students and can help say to students, you know what, you would really like working with Sean, right? So I think if you're, if you're an adjunct or you're a tenure track, you want to move the balance so that it's mostly safe with a little bit of weird and then as your situation changes, then you can move that needle. But I, I would not recommend jumping all the way to weird. 
Does that sound like sensible? That place? It gets weirder with tenure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think you know, this notion that you're providing a frame for people to understand it. So that what you've done today here in this presentation, giving a frame for talking about why it's important to talk about the fails or learn from the fails. And I think if you frame for students that these are skills that are translatable, that whole notion that you can take this ability to fail and learn from failure and talk to people about why in a job setting, that's what they're worried about, uh, um, why that's productive yeah. and something that people would want to have in an employee and, or in a, in, in a faculty member or whatever. Yeah. So I think the, the kind of framing that you're doing here is really critical, particularly to the pedagogical applications of it. And, and in more recent years, I've actually done a version of this kind of talk for my students at the beginning. Yeah. So, so I say, this is what you're in for. This is how I think things work. This is how I think you're going to get stuff out of this course. If this isn't you, if this just makes you physically sick, yeah. <laughs> then now's the time to either talk with me yeah. or maybe this isn't the right place. It strikes me that there's a real analog here with uh, community-engaged research because it's so much about the process mm -hmm. yes. as opposed to um, yeah, some product at, at the end. And so we have faculty who engage their students in through the cla through classes in, in community work, and uh, it's it's that process of learning how to engage in that work that's as important as yeah. anything as an outcome. But again, it's about the framing to help students understand at the beginning. This is going to be frustrating. This is going to be hard. This oh, is it's not going to work. And it, like that that whole heritage crowd thing gutted me. Right? And I, I spent a long time when that happened thinking, holy shit, I don't belong here. I can't get this to work at all. And that's where the, the credo slide comes from as well. But I, I think, yeah, there is public archaeology, community engagement, that kind of archaeology is so important and needs to be valorized so, so much more because it connects everything we do from our teaching to, to everything else. You're still teaching. Well, but, but I'm not in the classroom, right? It's not, um, and I know there are other people yeah, yeah. who are not who are not in higher education. Um, it, and, and it comes down to also being able to build a culture among your staff within your institution um, that accepts this kind of, you know, this, this idea that we make mistakes. And we've all worked on an excavation site. It's, Right with mistakes, <laughs> like it, and, and mistakes you can't fix, right? If, if you take a strat out in the wrong order, you can't put it back. <laughs> we all know this, right? Um, and I was when I talk to field school students or with my staff, it's always you know this is one of the major takeaways of our discipline is you're gonna have problems. It's gonna happen. We're gonna take out the wrong strat. We're gonna decide to open the wrong unit. We're gonna excavate a feature wrong. We're going to forget to write down our coordinates. We're going to like we're going to take elevations wrong. At some point, it's going to happen all the time. Get over it. Write it down and move on. Yep. Because we can't fix it. Like I cannot fix. I can't retake the elevations of this level because it's gone. The level is gone. <laughs> right. Right. We're three inches deeper now. So we can't. You know, we can't get that again. So we deal with it. We write it down. Um, so I think this is something that is actually ingrained in our methodology as practicing field archaeologists, right? So it sh shouldn't be foreign no. to us. But then also making sure that we're establishing it. So I like to think that we have a culture at our site where mistakes are talked about and are open and are discussed. Do they make it into your publications? What's that? Do they make it into the publications? What publications? <laughs> 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 They'll make it into they make it into reports if we have something up. Yeah, yeah. we can write about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know we review our guides and procedures every year to readdress. So my field guide from last year is different than my field guide from this year, and next year's will be different. We revisit all of that stuff every winter to make sure that we're accounting for things that didn't work the year before. Yeah. Um, but it's it's built into who we are as archaeologists, and I think it's just to sort of move us. Broader idea. You know, yeah. it's, it's not just the digital archaeology thing, and it's not just people who are writing research projects. Like, we mess up all the time. <laughs>
Yeah. But we're, we're good at putting a really positive spin mm -hmm. on things. Speaking of fails, one last digital fail. Turns out there's a microphone here on the desk that I haven't been wearing for any of this time. So the whole internet feed's probably been. <laughs> they hung in there. They hung in there. They so hung in there. Awesome. So thank you all. You've been well watched and well commented. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. In the best possible way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and they've all learned lip breathing. So oh, well, that's, that's good. So what do you say, Ethan? Is it time for coffee? Yes, let's have a break. All right. So we'll take a 15-minute break. Uh, let's say back here at 10.35. That's 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> Minutes-ish. That's totally cromulent. Yeah. yeah. Uh,
next. Um, I'm a bit worried about doing this after Sean. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll start running around. <laughs> right, so I'm going to talk about digital transformation, the journey you've all been on this year. This is last year. We got a little bit lost. <laughs> now, walking over here from breakfast with a couple of these people, they have got no idea where they're going normally. So they just tag along with Terry and watch where he's going. And last year, Terry disappeared. I knew where I was going, but I just let them walk along and see what they're doing. So we got to the, to the gardens, and they all went, oh, where do we go now? So they all go like that. <laughs> but you're all going on this journey at the moment. You're building websites and resources, and you don't really know where you're going, generally. Don't worry, we're imposters. We don't know where we're going, and we're meant to be professionals who do this as a living. You've got a general idea of what you want to do, but it changes constantly. You iterate on what you're doing, and you change your mind regularly. So digital transformation is a very weird concept. It might not fit with your organisation. Are any of you working by yourselves? Yeah, some people are. So you decide what you're going to do. You don't have too many people telling you what needs to be done for your organisation. You decide, and that's quite a nice way to be. It's the way I used to be when I worked for the Antiquity Scheme. I came up with an idea, I implemented it, because I thought it was the best thing to do. It's a nice way to be, actually. You can actually get things done. But then you start getting worried about things you haven't done, and like Eric tweeted earlier, he disappears into his code because he hasn't done it, and then it makes it even worse, because you then realise you've got more work to do. So digital transformation is a massive thing for you to go through. Talk to Alex, she's got lots of things she needs to put through in her organisation as well to get her project done. How many of you in this room are finding it hard to get your projects done because of organisations? Lots of people. And is that because they don't understand what we're trying to do? Ethan's giving you a very hard thing to do? Or is it just because you don't think you have the skills yet? Don't worry about skills, you can learn them as the thing goes, time goes by. When I first started di doing digital work, I hadn't got a clue. I was working for British Telecom in an office doing data entry and I thought, I'm bored stiff. I decided to learn how to use the web to make a career. So I started taking websites to pieces, copy copying and pasting code. And that's how I'm still working really, I copy and paste code. There's lots of control C, control V. Sean, is that how you work? Yeah. It's, it's a good way to work. I mean, you can copy other people's work. Stand on the shoulders of giants. It's the way to be. There's lots of really clever people out there who can do it far better than you. And I've noticed a lot from talking to you, you don't really know what questions to ask. Just put the question into Google the way you think you might ask it. Someone has always had the same problem as you when you're trying to use Python or PHP or WordPress, and you'll get the answer from them. It's not something to be afraid of. Ask for help. That's something you must always do. So the strategy for delivery. I'll let you read those as well. Oh, well, it's not shown properly. So I'm quite a big fan of Dilbert. Let's try that. Is that better? That's, better. That's better, isn't it? Ah, yes. Does anyone feel this at all when they're going to work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Dilbert's spot on. If you're going to do presentations, Dilbert's always a good place to go. You'll find something that's really relevant to what you're doing. You can be quite honest without actually saying it. And then you might come across this last year, the hype cycle. Don't worry too much about what's at the top at the moment. Look at these bits here. Where are you at the moment? Are you on the slope of enlightenment? Or are you in the trough of disillusionment? Who's there at the moment? Who's in the trough? <laughs> uh, plateau of productivity? Um, depends on the time of day. I think at about 9 o'clock we were in the bar and we weren't really being very productive. We were being quite. Well, what were we doing last Sean night? Sean, yeah, sure, what were you doing last night? <laughs> Your plateau of productivity. You were doing very things with, funny things with images, making us look rather weird, bird faces, all sorts of strange stuff. Yeah. So now go back to the top of the hype cycle. And there's all these things that Gartner been predicting people will be doing, like 3D printing. And I thought this was really good to put in. And then I looked on the internet this morning, and a new version came out. So there's a new version today. Still the same things at the bottom. But virtual reality is what everyone's talking about now. It's quite expensive to do. We talked about it yesterday. It makes Sean sick. So just think about where you are on this at the moment. Can you get out of points as well? If you look at the things that you might think about doing. There's 4D printing on there. I'm not really even sure what that is yet. <laughs> Yeah. New things. So well, let's go back to your projects. Mm -hmm. Did many of you use project management techniques at all? Anyone think about it? <coughs> One, two, three. What sort of things did you use? Did you think about Lean or did you think about Prince2? Prince2 is the bane of everyone's life. It's really complex and quite hard to do. Can you actually read this? 
not sure if you can. Can you read it? Yeah. It says, we're going to try something called Agile programming. That means no more planning and no more documentation. Just start writing code and complaining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it has a name. That was your training. There you go. <laughs> so how many of you actually documented what you've been doing over the last year with code notes and things like that? Any of you writing documentation? Brilliant. Right. When I built the Portal Antiquity Scheme website, it's probably about one million lines of code. I didn't document as I went along. I suddenly realized that was a bad idea and decided to retrospectively go back and document it. <coughs> it. Took me a year. I would not recommend that to anyone. Eric, are you documenting your code as you go along now? Yes. Yeah. Did you do it at the start when you first began programming? Or did you just write code and see? No, 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 that's, I checked the whole thing. Yeah. Starting to scratch your paper. Yeah. So do you document what you're doing. Someone might leave from your project, or you might hand it on to someone else because you get fed up doing this work. If they can't understand what your code's doing, then what are they going to do? They'll do what Eric just did, scrap it and start again. So they reinvent the wheel. How many of you did user testing? The stuff you've been building so far. Has anyone tested with users? A few people are saying yes. You've got a really nice audience in this room to start testing your products with. Ask people to have a look at what you're doing, report back and say, that doesn't work. See what they're doing. Shut up when you're watching them do the work. Don't tell them what to do. Let them do it, and then you realize where they're going, where you've <coughs> gone wrong. The user is the person who uses your website. It's not you. It's not you who's going to use your virtual reality environment. It's them. It's all these people out here. So again, Dilbert. Just let you read what he said. I'm not here to get people who did art history, by the way. <laughs> Alice Lynn. I said, I'm not going to dig at people in the art history. <laughs> Sorry, just plugging in before it goes black. So, did anyone reinvent the wheel this year? Start things that they suddenly found out were out there and they could use again. Matt's going, yes. I think we've all done this. We've all gone off and started doing something, and then you've done a search on the internet and found out that someone's written the library. Ben Marwick's written some really good code, as we've already talked about earlier. So I started doing stuff a year ago, and I found out Ben had done it already. So you go and reuse his code. And who researched their audience? Did anyone research the audience they thought was out there? Do you actually go and do user personas, work out what people might do, what they wanted to do? Think about it as public archaeology. We haven't really talked about public archaeology at all in this course. The public are the people you're serving. Try and get out of the thought you're just serving other academics. You want the wider audience to actually appreciate what you're doing and sell archaeology. We all complain about the fact there's no money. If we're not selling it to the general public, why is your senator, your congress, anyone going to give you money to do work? If they don't see the greatest public benefit. It's the same in the UK. We have to sell it effectively. And we're not very good at telling stories. And that's some of the stuff that we've been talking about, the tools that Sean brings up. We can tell stories very well. And if you go to a Google conference, they always start with videos of Stonehenge, the pyramids. Archaeology is the things that go by. They talk about the past. Why aren't we capitalising on that and actually building on it, and the stuff that we do? That's what you're trying to do. Maybe on a smaller scale, but you might actually go bigger at some point, or go viral, as they always talk about in marketing. So how many people thought about this <laughs> as a way to work? Build it, and you actually get an audience. This is talked about a lot in the museum world. We'll build it, and people might come to it. You have to think about why you should build that thing in the first place. Did you actually think about your idea of why you should build it in the first place? This is something you must think about at the end of your project. Or is it just something you did because you needed a project to do? And who felt overwhelmed? Everyone. The like sky's falling on your head. <laughs> now, I found this really hard this year. We've been talking about it as a faculty. I found the multiple communica communications channels really hard to deal with. I didn't know where to go to talk to any of you, really. I used Twitter. I tried to use the comments. I found the comments really hard to use because it's quite slow. Sometimes I got emails, sometimes didn't. I didn't know whether I should go in this and look. Slack, I didn't use at all. Did people use Slack this year? Some people did. We use Slack at work. I forget to go in there and look as well. So maybe it's just me and I forget to go in Slack. It's sort of a weird conversation at work. People go, let's open another Slack channel. Like, oh, OK, great. Uh, I don't even like email. <laughs> I'd rather just have people communicate with my Twitter. It's going to be very short and pithy. And did any of you iterate as well? So did you start things, iterate and realise that you think what you're building didn't quite work, start again, do other things? Anyone do that? A few people. This is the way to work. Build your tool, test it with people, not yourself, test it with a few people, and design, test, keep going around. Keep going around the circle until you get to where you need to be. 
And I hope that none of you think the project you finish end of this assignment is actually going to be the finished project. Go back and do it again if you've got time. And this is one of the principles that lots of people talk about in the museum world. Create once, publish everywhere. And this is very aspirational. If you're building um, assets for your project, think about reusing them in multiple environments. I was talking to Heather about YouTube and how you've got a video that you can repurpose in multiple different places. If you think about publishing your stuff in Facebook Live, can you bring that back into your website if you're going to do video? It's very hard to do things with that. You might have the asset somewhere else that you can reuse in different ways. If you've got tweets, you can import them back into your website as well. If you've got data, you can use it in different ways. So think about how you can use your things over and over again. And we talked about this yesterday, the release early, release often principle as well. So don't be scared about showing your stuff to people. Release it early, get feedback. Don't wait until the last day of the assignment and set, publish it and go, there you go, it works. People look at it and go, that doesn't work. And you go, it's too late to fix it now. So keep going, just showing it to people regularly. And how many of you actually use GitHub effectively this year? Not many people. Now, I find that slightly disappointing because GitHub was the thing that we really tried to push at the start. If you've got code from this project at the end of it, please put it on GitHub. You can share it with everyone else and you can do version control. Heather we were talking to yesterday, and she said today, uh, last night I created a web page and I lost it overnight. But you didn't use GitHub to version it, and you it haven't got safe trash, yeah. So you get back from that. But think about how you work. So if you're doing a version stuff, you can always go back to the one previously. Now, how many times have er Eric's probably done this? We've written a page, power's gone out, or you just pressed the wrong thing, it's deleted it, and you spent hours doing it, and you just go, oh, no. If I commit it to GitHub, it would have saved everything. We're still doing it, and we're doing it regularly as, as a job. Sean talked about uh, Zenodo and getting DOIs for your code as well. This is quite important. You can actually cite your code and make it findable by other people. And how many of you thought about measurement of your resources? Has anyone started using Google Analytics effectively yet? We talked a little bit about it with a few people. But anything you do should be able to measure. You need to work out who's using your resource, whether it's actually being, making an impact on people. Uh, these figures here are quite high. Uh, I took these from one week of the British Museum website. So can you see there's 826,000 users in a week? Now yesterday I was talking about impact, audience and reach. And I said that we've got 66 million people in the UK. So we've only reached 826,000 of those 66 million people. That's not what we want. We have big targets for the museum. I'm not going to tell you what targets are because I can't remember them. But they're big. We want to reach millions of people a week, not thousands. And if you're going to use different platforms to do stuff, find ones that you can actually measure the impact of stuff that you're doing. So yesterday I mentioned that Facebook, where you can measure how many people have viewed your 3D model. On Twitter, you have analytics, so you can work out how many people have looked at your tweets in the week. On Sketchfab, you can find out who's looked at your models. So go to places where you can actually measure things backwards into your platform as well. People are always going to be interested to go, well, did that actually get seen by anyone? If it's not seen by anyone, is it actually useful? So why are you measuring? Well, you want to make data-driven decisions. You want to know why you should do that, why that resource should go up and be used in the first place could potentially save you money. <coughs> and it gives you insights in what's going on with your organisation sometimes. And it validates your work. You actually feel that you've done something that's made an impact and is useful to people. You can go back and retrospectively fit these measurement tools into your programme if you haven't done so far. It's not the end of the world if you haven't thought about it so far. We can do it today, we can do it tomorrow. It's something very quick and easy to do. How many people in the room are producing a website as their end resource? I think it's quite a lot of people now. No one's really producing walks or environments or something really big that you can't put these tools into. If you're embedding your walkthrough into a website, then at least you can measure stuff and show people. And are you thinking about being social? Have you enabled social features? Have you got a Twitter account? Have you got a Facebook account? Maybe you've got other places you've been. Uh, this slide comes from a conference I ran a couple of years ago with Kinara Bonacci. I can't remember who actually put the slide up, but I thought this was quite apt for what we're doing. The tools of the revolution, it's changing rapidly. Social media is changing rapidly as well. Are you on the right platform? Think about that for your audience. Uh, Terry does a lot of work on social media for his audience as well. And I think you're going where you think your audience is. You talk to people and find out whether they've got Facebook profiles or, or Twitter. There's a lot of great Pew research. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're pumping out annual by annual. Yeah, it's a fantastic resource to look at. It's one of the big things. If you're not going where people are actually going to be, they're not going to find your resource. And this comes on to can you be found? Search engine optimization is actually quite a simple skill. Just read a bit on the internet, put the right meta tags on your pages, think about using Open Graph. I've been talking to Terry about this and Twitter cards. 
so that your content, you tweet something, comes up with a profile picture and a bit of background. It's quite easy to do. If you want help with this, I'm very willing to help. It's, it's something I, I do quite a bit of at work. This was something that really worried Eric yesterday. We were talking about archiving. How many people in the room have actually thought about archiving their code, their data, their work at the end of the project? Has anyone got money to do that in the first place built into what they're doing? Possibly not. It's not too expensive. Eric's really expensive because he lives in California. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the Archaeological Data Service in the UK, they'll take your resources. Um, they've got a calculator on their website. So you can say, I've got 10 CSV files, and they'll tell you how much it will cost for a year. I think Tada does the same thing. Tada, whatever you call it, Tada. <laughs> 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 so if you haven't thought about archiving, get on with it now. <coughs> sustainability. Will your project actually last past this institute? Have you actually thought about whether you're going to keep it going? And that's really important. You want a legacy product that stays up. Have you got funding to keep your website going for at least three years? Then think about how quickly you might have to refresh your project as well. Eric, what's your life cycle for replacement of interfaces for open context? Three years? Two years? Yeah, we'll probably have two years. Yeah. Uh, when I ran Portal Antiquities, it's a two or three year life cycle before you replace the product. Things change so quickly now that you're out of date by tomorrow when you've written something in the first place. Uh, Micropass, the crowdsourcing platform, we're two versions behind the one that's running now. It still works, but we're lagging, we haven't got the same features. WordPress, keep updating it. Like Sean said, if you don't update your platform, you're going to find that security holes come in, you get hacked, you then find out you've had um, code injected, and you lose your work. And then you produce a really good talk like Sean just did because you've done something and failed. Has anyone thought about communicating their product or their project to other people? Getting the institution to buy in. Now, I know this is going to be very hard for lots of you. Your institutions might think, well, we're not going to communicate what you've been doing because you've been doing it as an academic research project. It's not on the big scale of things. Try and get the institution to buy into what you're doing. Find somewhere where you can broadcast it, maybe the press, the web, local media, just someone who might actually pick your product up. We were quite lucky with the crowdsourcing project. We had a friendly journalist at The Guardian, May Kennedy, who wrote about our project. And then we got, had a British Museum blog that had a reasonable audience. So we managed to label the project as citizen archaeologists about what people were doing. So if you can find some way of making your project interesting for people to look at, that's a good way to actually start selling it. Now, this is something that I suppose we will go back to regularly when we talk about this. What were your aims for, this pro for your project? Have you actually achieved your aims? Do people think they're achieving their aims from this institute? Talking to many of you, I think you are. Maybe not in the way you thought at the start, so you've changed your aims and you've changed your dreams or scaled back. I don't think that's a bad thing because I think your grand ideas have actually given you something you can work from in the first place. I had grand ideas about what I do as a career. I want to be an astronaut. Ah, well, never mind. So I just put this delivery checklist together as well, just things that you can actually think about. Um, all, my, all my slides are online. You can just get this from there if you don't want to write anything down. I'm hoping this is most of the stuff you might want to do. Uh, there's a few things missing, obviously, because I've probably haven't talked about Licenses are a big issue that we talked about yesterday. It might involve more negotiation before you can actually go live, but you have to go and talk to a few people about what you're going to use. And if you're using images from the web to fill out your project, do make sure you've got the ownership of them, or you ask permission from your wife before she shouts at you. <laughs> <laughs> These bits are very important. When you finish your project, do celebrate. Make yourself feel good about it and tell people you've done something good and then start again. Go back to the start and iterate and do the next bit. Have some of this later. So I thought I'd just talk about a few products I've worked on this year. So I've been on a journey as well. I've been building stuff at the British Museum. It's not just you that are doing this sort of stuff. I've had lots of things to do. I think Eric, Terry, everyone else in the room who does this stuff, they've been working on their own products as well. So this is a very simple website that we built for the British Museum. It's an African rock art project. We were talking about this with Anne yesterday. And it's an archive of 25,000 images that were donated to the British Museum. It's a born digital project from the very start. We built a website using a content management system called Contentful, which is an API-driven interface. And we built a website using a, a generator called Yeoman, which is a very quick way for scaffolding websites. It's possibly something we could have talked about at the start of the Institute. It's too late now. Um, I think we could point you in the right direction for it. And we used a web framework called AngularJS. I didn't like this language and an interface very much because it's not very good for search engine optimization. If you want to go on this website, right click on it, and look at the source code, so view source, and see what you see. 
you won't see any HTML apart from the placeholders. So search engine finds it very hard to pass. We then launched a new audio guide within the British Museum as well, which allows people to actually go around the museum, stop at places and listen to some audio. The system actually works out where you've been and creates a list of stops that you stopped at. When you finish, you take your device to a, a clearing point, you put it down on an NFC tag, and it clears off your system. It sends you an email if you put your email into it. Uh, this URL gives you an example. And an API sitting in the background sends that email out to you with all the information. It's quite simple. Uh, it's used by lots of people. This took about 10 versions to get right, going backwards and forwards with the project manager. Um, I got asked to do this because they were overwhelmed with, with work for themselves. And they said, well, you know what you're doing with PHP. Can you build it for us? And I was, okay, I'll give it a go. And this is the biggest project I've been working on. Um, we're just about to launch this next week on the 25th. And this is a holistic knowledge search of all the British Museum resources. So it's actually the art collection, uh, the website, the shop, uh, the research papers, everything all at one, in one go. Using something called Google Search Appliance. It's an expensive bit of technology. It's not been my favorite bit of technology I've ever used. But the result is actually quite nice. Um, I'll give people the link to this after the talk. I won't give it out now because I don't want people to find out about it on the wider web before that. I mean, in lots of projects are microfast as well. So I had fun with Michelle doing the Denver Art uh, Museum stuff. That didn't take too long to do, as I, we were saying yesterday. We've been doing stuff with the Egyptian Museum in Turin, uh, the Egypt British Society, and the British Museum. We've lots of different apps for, for that as well. Let's take a little bit of time. But I've been using the principles that we've been learning from this. I've been making sure we document. I've been making sure we iterate and build, test. It's not perfect, but it works. Yesterday, I spoke about 3D at length. 3D is the most iterative project that we ever do. You can go back through these things again and again to make things better and better. <coughs> Your photo masking could be slightly out for the first time you do it. You go back and do the, the photo masking again. I could redo some of the models I showed you yesterday three times to get different results if I, if I did a little bit more editing to them. So you can iterate regularly. You always want to improve what you're doing with this so people think they're good. Uh, I can't remember as many text on that side. I don't think there's... Did I show this last year? These are the new products that the museum did with Google. Um, if you do a search for Museum of the World on your computer, with, or with Google, com forward slash British Museum, you'll find this interface. It's written in a programming language called WebGL, and it's got sound attached to it. You put your mouse over these areas, and you get interactive uh, results that go off to the Google Culture Institute for British Museum resources. It's sort of a silo. People go off into this and perhaps don't come back to the British Museum. But it's a nice interface. We've gone out to a platform where millions of people use it every day. And we were the very first museum to appear on the Google homepage for search, underneath the search box, saying, search British Museum, in, find out more about the world. So it's a really high impact delivery. We were very lucky to do this. We got exposure to the masses. Now, I'm not pretending that we can do that generally for people in this room. But it's the idea that archaeology has got out there to a larger audience. And we want people to know about archaeology, about museums, about culture. And it's a very good platform to do that. If you have a small museum, Google Culture Institute will perhaps talk to you about getting their stuff into their index. But is it a silo that's perhaps not good? You can't take data out of it at the moment, but maybe your museum should be the ones that create the resources where you can take data out, so you have your own API. You can also see the museum on Google Street View as well. It's the largest indoor space in the world where you can actually navigate internally. The new search engine, when you do a search for objects that are within the Street View, actually tells you where they are as well, so you get the map come up and you can go and navigate to them. They've also launched a new audio guide as well. Uh, this is HTC handsets. Uh, it's a revenue generation device. So people are paying for it. Uh, they go around the museum. They enjoy themselves listening to the audio. They bring them back. And hopefully they spend lots of money in the shop afterwards. Revenue generation is crucial to what we're doing at the moment. We need more money to fill the gaps where the government funding has gone down. And one of the things they do to try and get you to, to buy it is give you samples on the website. So when you're looking for your ticket, you can listen to some, up, some samples of the audio guide. It might help you decide you want to use it. It might turn you off. This depends on the user. These are put into SoundCloud. We can actually measure how many people have actually listened to each clip as well. So we get a metric back from that. We also have metrics from Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics, depending on what we're using, which shows where people clicked. So when you look at people's usage of web pages, you quite often find that no one looks in the bottom right-hand corner. So if you've got stuff that's really important, don't put it down there. Make sure it's where people do look. So if you can get a user testing lab, Watch what people are doing with their eyes and where they're moving their mouse. There are web tools out there for heat mapping web pages. So you can find out something called Crazy Egg. It gives you a heat map, and you find out no one goes over there. 
and you put your most important resource there. So Pippa decides that she wants to put her new map, which she spent weeks and hours putting together. My video. Or video. And you put it on the right-hand side. Two weeks later, you go back and look at the analytics. And videos. No one's looking at it. Everyone's looking on the left-hand side of the page. So you move it back over there, and you realize that people are using it. Carousels, are they a good thing? Do people actually click on them, or do they just get annoyed with them and move somewhere else? Do they serve a purpose? That's the sort of things you can find out from metrics. Another resource that got launched last year as well is the What is the Request Explorer. This is a microsite built by a third-party agency. We're very lucky we can employ agencies to do work for us. We tell them what we want, they do the build. We tell them they're doing it wrong, go back to them. So they're doing all the build and iteration for us instead. And that's the end, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit fast. Terry. Oh, hello, Max. Oh. Yeah, anyway. oh. And you're in the dark, apparently. So. I'm, I'm in the dark. Okay. Does he want to stand in front of the screen? Yeah. Hey, Max. Oh. <laughs> oh, and Isabella. Let's say hello to her as well. Uh, any questions? No. no. Oh. Who wants to go first? Heather or Eric? Eric. I, do you want to answer this without the camera on? But uh, <laughs> no. Which, do you want to come no, back to it at the end and do Heather's first? If it's well, I sensitive I, to? Yeah, I mean, the Google Call Flow Institute is an interesting player in this space, and I just wanted to know about what um, people have, what their experience is, what issues people have had, and are there sort of you know, policy concerns that we should how about consider we, with that? How about we come back to that? Because it could be quite a robust discussion between everyone in the room. Okay. Because I think lots of people might have an opinion on putting stuff onto Google as a platform. And we do Heather's question, and then perhaps we can go, go on. Yes. Well, when you talked about Google Analytics, and I yeah. think uh, a bunch of us are interested in that, but we don't, I mean, I don't really, I haven't got anything on there, and I don't know how to do it, and which is, is that's the best thing. And then the other thing is, uh, before we launch, how to secure our website so they're not spammed or whatever. Right. Um, you're hosting your stuff yourself, aren't you, for your website? You bought a package that is a commercial company? Yeah, uh, yeah. yes, I did. So I've got my own web domain. I've got total control. So, so we can do quite a lot of stuff with you to have a look as well. Google yeah. Analytics is very easy to install. It's just a JavaScript thing. I think it's possibly the best analytics package for you as a group because it's free. There's a free tier that you can use. And it's very widely used by lots of people in different industries. So you can always find help with it. Uh, we, it works on GitHub pages and various other pages. So I think we can probably help with that. Most of the faculty can help with that, can't they? Sarah, you can help with Google Analytics. I, think so. I, couldn't, I couldn't get it to install on GitHub. Okay. So it wasn't a valid URL. Uh, I'll give you some help afterwards. Uh, any other questions? How do you guys choose internally uh, between you know building stuff with your own resources like you? I mean, you, you build the African Rocker thing yeah. versus going outside and contracting. I think a lot of it comes down to project money. Uh, so when we're working on new projects, we usually get given a budget that has digital as an add-on generally. So if it's a curatorial project, there's usually, say, £10,000 set aside for web work. If it's not particularly large and it's a very small project, we could build it in-house. If we want something very high-end with a full-service agency, which does the user testing, everything end-to-end, -end, we go out. And there's government limits about how much you can spend without having to enter tender. Uh, but quite often we do ask for a few people to quote for us, uh, not too in-depth. And then for big things, they're over £100,000. It has to go out to the, something called the OG tender. And then that's 100 page documents people send in to say what they're going to do. And then you have to go through a long process of matrix marking. It's, it's, it's hard work. So I think it's done on a project by project basis, usually. Um, Are so you part of that process with the um, curatorial team or the exhibit team? Uh, I am because of the role I'm in now. Um, there's sort of an interface between different people. So we have product managers based on different areas of the collection. So for the audio guide and new website, they're under one project manager. She's the head of digital projects, and she's deciding what happens for all of those. Um, we're now having discussions about where the research stuff fits into that, and the new collection online. So that's one of the projects I've got, is to rebuild the entire collection online to make it usable in a different way. So I want to make sure that we can perhaps get links to, say, Open Context or Namisma or Geonames into our collection. So we can actually go out to all the resources. At the moment, the British Museum collection is really insular, so it just points to itself. There's no linkage outside. And that's not what we'd be talking about as a group. And there's been lots of work on this about trying to make things useful. Because uh, you can pull things in as well. 
So at the moment, you can't do a map of anything on the British Museum website. There's no coordinates held within our content management system. They've just got place names. And that's not really ideal, because I think when visitors come in now, they might be from, say, down the road from here. We might have a collection from East Landing. You want to find out what's been found within that area? You can't do that. You can find it by place name, but you can't see that something was found 10 miles down the road, or in Ontario, or just that sort of thing. So we've got lots of projects we can do to make things better. Any other questions, or shall we <coughs> turn off streaming? <clears throat> what about linking to things like academia.edu or ResearchGate? Uh, yeah, well, I think we've got some issues internally about that because we have huge oil staff putting up uh, papers that haven't got copyright clearance. But like we've talked about generally, that people do put things up that are off prints they don't have permission to put up. Um, so we generally won't link to academia at the moment. Um, we're trying to work out whether we have an institutional repository or not. Well, I talked to, uh, I saw there's a lot of variation amongst archaeologists of what they do uh, in terms of putting articles um, on the web and on their own websites or university websites. So I talked to a university librarian and said, can I do this on my department Facebook or department website? And at that time, the response was, uh, it's assumed to be single use. Um, so you're assuming that if you post one copy, then someone is going to come and take, uh, download one copy for their own personal use. So I printed out that email and taped it to my computer. But, you know, that's just sort of out there. So anything I've ever written, I've never ever signed an agreement with the publisher for copyright transfer. So all my stuff has always gone up straight into academia or ResearchGate or wherever I feel like putting it. And my colleagues at work are always saying, so you've never signed anything for your, your work? But, so any journal I've written for, never ask me to sign anything, which I don't think is the experience most of you probably have. Mm -hmm. but, but that could be oversight by the companies I've been working with. The, one, the reason that people want to put things on academia, EDU in particular, is that this recent study showed that your citation rate increases 60% if you put, put it on academia, EDU. And a lot of people don't want to put it on there because of, of because of copyright issues. And in theory, people can come after you. Some <coughs> journals and some places will let you put up a proof version. And so, I mean, you have to kind of look at it and you have to decide whether you think somebody's going to come after you or not. But putting it up does improve getting it out. And that's a fact. I think it's there's an option where you can host it on your web. Like a lot of people, you can post, do a link. Yeah, they yeah, just make it as a link, and mm -hmm. they put, you know, you put the title and the keywords, mm -hmm. but then it says either email the author for right. a copy, or you can link it to your personal website so that you still get the benefits, right. but you don't. But you need that <clears throat> the benefits, and if it's a, you know, and and then the other thing that happens is, is if you're putting stuff up, you're also hurting other analytics because. Unless you put up the DOI and have that be the link, then you're not getting the hits on the article that count. There's, there's some quite interesting discussion uh, papers by Melissa Terrace about citing papers as well. So she's talked about if you tweet about your article or put something on social media, more people are going to read it. And she's shown that's the way to get more people to read it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I know Eric and uh, lots of other people have been talking about this in social media space, about the ethics of academia versus other places to put mm -hmm. data, which I think is probably another conversation for but not, not now, but maybe later on there's a different mm -hmm. discussion. Yeah. So I have a link now to my department. I've got publications there. So I'm just sort of following what our university said. So I'll, I, and that's I, fine. I, I yeah. quite like academia, just because I've got one paper that's been read 8,000 times. And I know the book's been out of the library twice in the last five years. <laughs> so at least someone's reading it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's also a, a, so the digital space is also a good place for things that are never getting published, like conference papers. Mm -hmm. um, Far more people who've seen a lot of my conference papers than I did. There are about three or four people in the room. Um, and I, I do videos where I record the slideshow and be talking over it and then you know, post those. And it's exactly the same. <laughs> same thing, and people get the content and they get excited and stuff like that. So thinking about other media. my 
So, so let's move on from this in that case. Yeah. Spoilers. We're interested. So before we turn off the live streaming stuff, did people find the checklist idea useful? For that yes. yes. Very. Now I know things are missing from it, so maybe we can make that document, uh, Google document, that people add to it, and they can say what they think should go on there as well, because uh, there's things I've overlooked definitely. Um, and then we could perhaps talk about from there other things you might need help with. So the GitHub problem might be something you do need to refresh your right at the end just to say I want to put my code up once we deliver. So shall we turn off and then have a chat about Google? <laughs> bye Massimo, bye Isabella, everyone at home, sorry I'm not as interesting as Sean. <laughs> 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 <laughs>